Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 104 of PD's awesome guest panel. And still, I can't believe I reached them double digits. I didn't think I was going to reach single, let alone a triple. Now, before I introduce tonight's special iconic guest star here tonight, I would like to introduce tonight's co-host for the evening, my dear friend, Christopher Patty. Hey, yo. Good to have you on again, Chris. Good to be here. <laughs> um, and also, uh, for, like I said before, tonight's guest I've been a fan of for a very, very, very long time. You may, may know this gentleman's work on shows such as PJ Mask, The Adventures of uh, Sam and Max, and one of my all-time favorite. Uh, wait, before I get to my favorite show, I want to also mention the Snoopy show. Uh, the Snoopy show, and he's one of my favorite shows of all time that he did as the main character himself, Pelswick, Nickelodeon's Pelswick. My guest at this time is veteran uh, voice actor, actor, screenwriter, Mr. Rob Tinkler. Rob, welcome, sir. How are you today? Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, it's an honor to be asked to be on your show, man. Total honor to have you here. I mean, uh, Chris and I followed your career for years. Like, and like, I loved Pelster growing up. Like, as a little boy, like, I would watch that show consistently, like every day. Like, whenever, whether it was on Nickelodeon or their sister channel, Nicktoons TV. It was I was really also a fan of Sam and Max. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, you know, those are the two good ones. You know, it's like, <laughs> those are real, those are two. You, I mean, you have really good taste. You like those shows. It's, uh, those were high quality shows. Pelswick was, uh, you know, every script was like, it was like Christmas morning opening, like your present. You're just like, whoa, whoa what's, what's going to happen? And it was, uh, super exciting. Same with Sam and Max. Pels Pelswick was a lot of fun, though. Uh, and, uh, such a, heartfelt show but also like so funny and just such an optimistic character you know uh considering his circumstances that's what i really loved about playing him yeah it was just a great show like the, the character development story uh storyline plot it was just excellent it was just brilliant writing yeah that's you know it's it's funny you and and as a screenwriter myself it's so the transition from when like a screenplay is a is a it's like one of those works of art that those buddhist monks do in sand knowing that the tide is going to come in and blow it all away and then it, it's like the screenplay is is like i mean you read it if you're a fan of writing and screenplay reading but it's a it's a it's an art form that gets you to the next Thing, which is the product which is the show or the movie so um what bringing someone's imagination to life is like you know my most favorite thing to do i i love it and i love when i write something and actors you know read it and we record it and it's always so much better than i ever could have imagined it it, it uh yeah it's it's a it's an awesome thing Bless you, sir. And one of the first questions I have for you, and this is going to be a typical cliche question, and that is, how and when did you get your first big break into acting uh, and or voice acting? Take us there. Okay, so I was um, in a, a, I was at university, um, Toronto Metropolitan University. It actually had a different name at the time, but um, I was, I think, in my second year of the theater arts program, and uh, we took a voiceover class and there was a guy who taught the class who was like, you know, a, a, a jobber, like a, a guy who was in commercials and shows and stuff like that. He'd been kicking around the industry for a really long time, although we didn't know any of this. We just th thought, okay, who's this guy who's, you know, handing us these scripts and, you know, giving us his advice. And, you know, I, I went into the booth for the first time not unlike this, kind of a tiny space, padded walls, like a crazy room. And uh, I get on the mic and I read this thing. It was like something to do with the Muppets. And the guy was, his name was Roland Parliament. And he was like, stop. Don't ever do that again. And I was like taken aback. I'm like, oh no, I messed up. What did and he was like, that's what I do. You're, you're stepping on my, on my rug. And I guess there was some crossover with the way I was performing and then the way he performs commercials or whatever. And he was like, felt threatened at first. But although he's messing with me a little bit and being supportive, and, but this is how supportive he was. At the time, he was directing a show called Sailor Moon. And he brought me in to the studio to audition for the character of Rubius on Sailor Moon. And... 
it, that basically started my career. That experience uh, alone, that, and that was the first thing I ever did. I know IMDb probably says something in different order, but like the very first thing I ever did, first professional gig was Sailor Moon. Oh, okay. And I, and I want to actually speak to you about that too. Like you mentioned IMDb too, like, cause, and Chris, before you ask your next question, I just wanted to clarify and uh, just get your information on this too, sir. But I just want to get your thoughts. Was your first voiceover role the 1991 Little Shop, like, or was it Sailor Moon? It was for sure Sailor Moon because I was okay. still in school. I hadn't even uh, I hadn't even booked anything yet. So I know the years are sort of like often I think, you know, if it went like Sailor Moon, the Rubius years were like 1995 to 98. But then Little Shop was in 1995, but I think it only went for one season. And so for whatever reason, it ends up first in IMDb. But it really wasn't because I... I booked Sailor Moon, and then I booked an on-camera show called It's Alive, and uh, through that, I got sticking around, I got Little Shop, I got all these other little, like, single one-off episodes of, you know, characters here and there, recurring characters, just playing, like, not lead characters or anything, playing, like, the neighbor, the kid, you know, at the ball at the ballpark, the, you know, just, like, the... the popsicle seller like whatever it was like they just had me do like a bunch of different like little voices and that's really where i, st I mean rubius was great in that it was like a villain and he was like a lead and it was super fun but that was like it was like a treat because i i got launched into that but then my career went the normal route which is you play the little extra parts the little um and then what i learned was and this is important for any of your listeners who want to get into voiceover if you can transform your voice, change your voice enough so that you can play like an old man, but then a kid, and then like like a big, you know, construction worker guy. Like the more you can like make variation in your voice, the better, the more you'll you'll get hired because it's cheaper for a company to pay you for multiple characters than it is for one character. So if they can bring you in for all the little extra roles, which is what I did, on shows like sticking around then they they bring you in and then they bring you back and that also gets you on the mic and gets you practicing and you get better and better at your craft oh okay and, uh sorry about my uh green screen it just acted up a little bit yeah you're disappearing <laughs> yeah I, I i'm a ghost apparently <laughs> um yep it's not, it's uh pre-recorded folks <laughs> don't mind this just, sorry, just give me a second whoop <laughs> okay. While I'm doing that, uh, while I'm configuring with this thing, uh, Chris, you have a question for Mr. Tickler? Uh, what are your preparations and methods before you do a voiceover role? Well, um, I like to sing. So I have uh, right next to me, I have uh, my guitar, and I will just like play some music. Just get like, that's the best way to sort of warm up your voice. Some people sing in the shower, breathe deep, breathe in that steam, that steamy warm air to get your you know, get uh, the air flowing to connect you to your diaphragm. Because I think voiceover, especially doing cartoons, is a, it's a little bit closer to singing than it is to acting. Because there's a musicality to the way that you say your lines. You want to approach each line in a different way. You don't want to do what's called mirroring. So... We do this in speech just in general because we don't actually think or pay attention to the way we speak or the musicality we speak with. But if you record something, if you say, um, we got to get out of here. What are you doing? Why are you standing there? Don't just look at me. Those are those the music. No, 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 no. That all sounds the same. If you approach lines like that in animation or commercials or whatever, it's that repetitiveness is uninteresting. So you want to go, what are you doing? Why are you standing? You want to change it up as much as you can, put it on different shelves, create variety. It's that variety that makes the director, the art director, want to draw your voice. And the more they want to draw your voice, the more you'll work. Talking with expression. Talking with expression. So it's closer to singing. So that's why I do, I'll sing, I'll do like voice, you know, trilling. Like, I, I, I sound like a lunatic uh, in my, you know, as I warm up in the morning. My family's all used to it because they know that I do it. But uh, 
you know, back in the day when I had roommates, I would I would hear there'd be like silence and they'd be like, what are you doing in there? <laughs> they didn't get it. But that's what I had to do. Um, yeah. To, to, so it's it's singing. It's just warming up your voice. I highly recommend anybody that wants to get into voice to cartoons, take singing lessons. Everybody thinks, oh, I got to take cartoon lessons. I'd say, yeah, you could do that. But singing will connect you more to your voice and your breath than anything else that is that is been far it, it'll widen your range too you'll be able to play sing, you know raise your voice higher and lower through that singing technique very cool and uh before i ask the next question there's no more glitching right on my end no glitcher mania going on no, you look good you look good okay good yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry about that everyone my apologies um the next question I have for you, and I ask this to all my guest stars that come on the show, and that is the raw emotion question. And I'm I'm a one person that loves good storytelling, like to make it believable to the audience. And this question I have for you, uh, Mr. Tinkler, and that is, if you were doing a scene, whether it be live action or voiceover, and this scene requires you and your co-star to get into this uh, heated argument, like uh, on screen, mm -hmm. and let, let's say theoretically you and I do a scene together. And then this scene requires us to do a, uh, like us, like yelling at each other or like, you know, lambast. And I come up to you and say, Mr. Tinkler, and I would say, Mr. Tinkler, because I have so much respect for you in the world. I would say, Mr. Tinkler, uh, in this scene, it requires us to do like this scene where we have to get so heated, so like angry at each other. And I think I had an idea, like a suggestion we could do to help not only tell a story, but also make it believable to the audience at home. And I know it's going to sound silly for me to ask, but. I need you to lambast me, lamb, I need you to lambast me and lay into me so hard that you can make me cry in frustration. If you were approached with this type of method, how would you react and what would you tell that said co-star? Go, go for it. Okay. <laughs> go for it. Whatever you know, let's let's do it. What, you know, whatever gets you there in the moment. Um, whatever looks good. I mean, because we may have that conversation and then the director's like, God, what are you guys doing? You know, they may have a completely different perspective. Also, they're the ones looking at the monitor and they're going, okay, do I buy that? Is that real? Because sometimes, you know, I've been in a scene where somebody's really come at you with like full raw emotion and they're like, okay, dial it back, more contained. It's more interesting if you, if you hold back versus like just letting it out and spitting all over the, the, the lens. But uh, I'm always like, I'm no judgment. I'm like, try it. Let's do it. Actually, I remember when I did uh, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. <laughs> I, in the, scene, the final scene at White Castle uh, with, with uh, John Cho, I told him ahead of time. And there was actually two other, uh, two other girls that were playing uh, my, my and Ethan Embry's like girlfriends, basically. And I said to them ahead of time, I'm going to say some mean stuff. Because my character was bad. He was mean. He was nasty. And I'm like, I'm going to say some stuff. And they were like, okay. <laughs> and I remember saying <laughs> stuff just in the lead up to the scene, uh, you know, because we had to enter. And I remember my the, the girl who played my girlfriend was like, I don't think she was so into it. Like she was like, uh, and I felt really bad and I apologized. And she was like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And the director was like, I loved it. It was great. Um, did it make it into the film? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, but certainly, uh, with John Cho, I was like, okay, let's, I'm going to be mean. I'm going to be nasty. I'm sorry if I offend you. I don't mean to, I'm playing a bad guy. And he's like, go for it. Do what you got to do. Most actors understand that code. Um, as long as you're, like, not wasting people's time on set, like, if it's, like, three in the morning and we've got a wrap and, you know, everybody's tired and you're, like, let's do the scene another way for me. Like, as long as you're not wasting their time, they're, they want you to play. They want you to come up with stuff. They want it to work. Everybody wants the project to be good. And the best way to make it good is to try stuff, to be interesting. Totally agree. And yeah. Although, suppose with the exception of when they might be doing, like, a Z movie, for instance. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it depends. It depends. It's always director has final say, producers have final say, showrunner have final say. Um, and But I will say my technique is I used to start as an actor, really be really nervous, and I would go up to them and go, I'm going to try it. I, I Just to let you know, I'm going to try it this way. And more often than not, I would be met with, 
uh maybe uh mm, i don't know about that cool directors would be like yeah go for it do it <laughs> but some would be the, the i i just realized oh i should just do it and show them what i'm thinking rather than trying to articulate what i'm imagining will happen because it it will ruin it but i found that if i just went for it nine times out nine times out of ten they went they would go yeah i love that that was i loved it and I went, I'm never telling people what I'm going to do before I do it again. And I don't. They'll tell me, this is what you do. This is your perspective. This is how, this is your character's POV. This is how you have to approach it. This is the energy coming into the scene. That's all great. Very useful information. But I'm not, I don't articulate what I'm going to do. And I think a lot of young actors do that. And it, it kind of spoils the surprise in a way. And because you, you want to, you know, you want to surprise people in, in a good way. Yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but. Do you think that being, with that being said, do you think that directors and or producers should like these days should give like more like creative input for the, the stars to like have them all, let them have their own like, you know, creative uh, input, like as far as, you know, character development, like how they deliver a line, et cetera. Well, I think that the director knows they're the ones that know, and you don't want, you know, if you have too many directors all, it's a problem. If everybody's trying to direct it, it's a problem. I've seen movies where, you know, you have a really great script, a really great story, and then you have, like, some stars who have a little bit of say and what they can, you know, what they, I want this to happen with my character and this. And then the 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 story gets kind of convoluted and muddy because you're just trying to make everybody happy. And so I I think... A lot of a lot of your intention as a character, like what your ca character you're playing, can be subtext. It can be what's going on in your head. You don't have to you don't have to articulate it. You don't have to tell people what you're doing. Sometimes, if you just do it, I mean, the other thing is sometimes you perform things a certain way and you're not really aware of what you're doing. Like, uh, you might. Uh, I I would do something like thinking I'm seething, and they'd be like. Oh, you're, that red is shy. Are you being shy? I'm, no, I'm not being shy. I'm seething. Oh, then like maybe put it in your breath a little more and find those things that, you know, that show the audience, get it out of your head and show the audience what, what you mean. And, but good directors will pull that out of you. I understand. And uh, Chris, before you ask your next question, I do want to ask uh, Mr. Tickler, um, like as a screenwriter though, like, do you, yeah. do you believe like because when I in the screenplay that I written like uh, Forever Villain that's the the working title for it, uh, I am I I'm one to like to use a lot of swerves and surprises. Um, you, are you a fan of those elements? Oh yeah, of course. As long as I, as long as you the audience is in on, like, as long as they can follow some aspect of the story, so you can have a plot twist here and there something unexpected come up take for example john wick right great movie series but it, we always know the emotional drive of john wick you always know where he's why he's doing what he's doing so you can have things where he shows up at a club and there's people there and you don't expect him to get into this fight or you, he steals a car you don't there's things that can happen in plot wise that you don't expect that's great as long as the audience can share in his emotional experience, we know why he's doing what he's doing. We know why he's seeking revenge. We know what, and I, John Wick is, you know, you know, one example. We owe, as long as there's something that the audience can hang on to. Because if you lose, if you're just, if it's all surprises, all of it surprises, the audience gets lost and they go, I, I don't, I don't know what to feel. I don't know who I'm rooting for. I don't know. Uh, it, it, the surprise it, it's just a movie of surprises you want it to have some emotional through line for your character some arc and then at the end you want them to change in some way to to well in films you want characters to change you want them to make some kind of realization along the way learn something along the way and and feel better get closure some resolve Maybe there's a cliffhanger. Maybe there's a still a, a question asked. But with television shows, the characters never change because that's why we turn up from week to week. That's why The Office was so great. Mike, Michael Scott 
never, uh, never changed. He was always the same. Jim never changed. I mean, maybe a little over the over the series arc, but generally speaking, shows characters don't change. Movies characters change. I see. And of course, we brought, <laughs> we, we brought up headphones earlier. Like, mm -hmm. and I, I want to tell you before it leads to Chris's next question that I'll tell you a little uh, story actually that I've heard on you, you know the show The Simpsons, right? Mm -hmm. There was an auto commentary for one of the Simpson episodes where one of the uh, directors or producers said that when they had Kurt Douglas in the studio, he hated wearing the headphones because it hurt his ears. And I did, and this is going to lead to Chris's next question. Do you prefer headphones on or off when voice acting? I prefer them on. I really like uh, I like hearing uh, I like hearing my voice. I like from the musicality aspect that I was talking about earlier. I like hearing it. I remember my first audition at Disney in LA. Um, they didn't have headphones. And every studio I had gone to prior had headphones. And I asked them, I said, do you have headphones? And they were like, they seemed kind of put off by it. I was like, they're like the engineer was like, headphones? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe we have headphones somewhere. And I'm thinking, this is Disney. You don't have headphones? But they also have a lot of, they use a lot of actors who are, on camera actors not necessarily voice actors who don't necessarily like sometimes if you if you have if you're not used to your the sound of your own voice it can sound weird do you remember the first time you heard a recording of your own voice and you're like ah, that's what i sound like i sound like that every every episode i do <laughs> right you're like oh my voice sounds so high i thought i had this nice bassy voice because i'm hearing it inside my skull but and it's resonating off of every bone in my head. But uh, you know, uh, some people can get used to it. I got used to that, but not everybody does. So, but yeah, I much prefer headphones. I can see why, because I definitely hate, the, like, I, I hate the sound of my own voice sometimes. I might play in the back, I'm like, wait a minute, that's how I sound? <laughs> it's funny, it's very common. I mean, I, I, I vividly remember one of my earliest memories is like, Going to my dad's office, he had like a like a voice recorder and recording, like being sneaky, he'd left the office and like hitting the red button and talking into it and then stopping and then like playing it back and going, who is, a, it sounded like another kid was teleported inside like this thing. Well, it sounded so separate from me. I had no idea, but. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, you feel like there's actually times when and you find yourself doing like a voice impression to sort of like maybe get a point across or even like, I don't know, try not to sound like too nerdy if you feel like you're sounding nerdy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. Uh, you sound the way you, we have a saying, I have kids, so it's like we have a saying in this house, you get what you get and you don't get upset. This is your voice. This is it. So use it to the full fullest extent that you could use it. Um, lean into the nerd. Why not? Yeah, embrace it, right? Embrace <laughs> it. Gotta embrace who you are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, occasionally here around my colleagues, I find myself uh, talking like butthead from Beavis and Butthead. Yeah. And, and even going with the like, eh, the like, I think we're supposed to do this kind of thing. <laughs> that was actually really good. That was good, man. Uh, Chris, you had a back-to-back -back question for Mr. Zinkler, right? Uh, yes. Okay. It's, uh, what are your memories working on The Busy World of Richard Scarry? We loved that show growing up. Oh, yeah. Uh, Richard Scarry. Oh, my God. That was so long ago. Um, I It was at the original Nelvana building. Um back i remember going in and they had like the posters up because they had done all nelvana did like the original like star wars animated stuff like droids there was a show called droids and um and so they did and ewoks and i, I remember those yeah and i was like oh this is cool okay this is cool and it was like literally the booth was like a it was like it felt like a shower stall it even had like a little like kind of rock to it it was like this is this it was so uh, interesting, but I loved the books, Rich. I I felt a reverence for it because I I remember reading the books as a kid, not actually reading the words, but like looking. That was the great thing about Richard Scarry was like all of the, you know, you'd look at the the tableau he created on the page, and I always looked for the little worm. There was always the little worm in the hat that was somewhere on the page, 
So I had great reverence for it, but what do I specifically remember about recording it? Not much, because I think it was probably at that, that time where I was playing like, you know, the deputy or like the plumber or the street sweeper, you know, whatever. It was like just little odds and ends. It was, um, I mean, it was great, great experience, but uh, it wasn't uh, like the first leading role I got main character was was sam and max freelance police was was max my, my boy max who uh that was and that was like oh my god that that was talk about christmas morning those scripts were unbelievable steve purcell wrote all of these amazing scripts and it was all you know it was like the first thing that i had worked on that was like based on like a comic and so there was so much to it but yeah, I mean, uh, I it's funny going back that far. Uh, I realized I didn't really pay attention. I was probably really like nervous and scared and just not wanting to screw up and not wanting to get fired. Um, you know, all those things that you feel when you're just starting out in any industry, you're like, ah, oh, just don't blow it. Oh, and then like leaving a session and then going in my head going, oh, they hated that. <laughs> I don't know that I'm narrating it because they would just be, you know, stone face they wouldn't tell me anything meanwhile it was great and they would hire me again so if there's anything that tells you you're doing a good job it's when people come back and hire you again hmm, interesting yeah uh, chris your next question all right circling back to uh, what you mentioned previously uh, what were your memories working on sailor moon as rubius okay so sailor moon first show i'm still in school you know, I think I went from class to the studio to go record. And there was this woman who was very, she was a pro producer, very talented, but very impatient. And I had originally conceived of the voice. I, they, they, it was done originally in Japanese. And the Japanese was almost like the character was sort of like, um, he had sort of a dusty quality to his voice. It was like really dusty quality and like almost like a Clint Eastwood sort of thing like that. And I would lock my jaw. And it, that's, that's what it sounded. The original Japanese sounded to me. So I was like, okay, so I'm going to do that. And so I did it. And then the producer called me and she's like, you're fired. And she used that term. She, was, she wasn't like, oh, things aren't working out. It was like, you're fired. And I was like, Oh, okay. Welcome to showbiz. Like just really de devastated. And then as I got my coat and turned to leave, she's like, wait, go back into the booth and do it as your, in your own voice. And then I did it in my own voice with a little bit of evil because he's an evil character. And that was it. And she's like, that's it. That's it. Just do it like that. It's like you nailed it. I nailed it, but I mean, I, I here I was thinking I'm, I'm I'm wanting to please them because I wanted to maintain what the original Japanese character did, but I I, I don't know. Maybe it was uh maybe it was her her ploy. Maybe it was her way of getting me out of my head. Maybe she knew I was thinking too much about what I was doing. I mean, it was a real challenge. I had never. You know, I'd bear, you know, I'd only dealt in scripts. You read the script, the words are on the page. And at that time it was, oh, you're, you're dubbing and you're looking at a big like movie screen. They projected the, the original show on this movie screen. And there was something called a rhythmo band. This is even before like anything digital happened. They would, and it was on film stock, clear film stock. And they would hand write all of the lines. So they were all in cursive. So if, if a character went, what like that they would write it out like they would stretch out the letters in cursive like an a like make the a really like physically make it long so that you would match the uh the vowel length of each character's line it was really challenging but it's like you're you know i'm trying to act but i'm also you know, it's kind of a little bit like or it was like karaoke. Once I made the connection, oh, it's like karaoke. It got a lot more easy for me because I went, karaoke's fun. This will be fun. I'll just have fun. So it was, but it was scary. So I, I you know, and, and so I got, I guess I got fired from the very first job I got, but then I got rehired within like five minutes. So 
Wow. And a guy like a, a definitely puzzles me that she wouldn't really want you to uh, just go with the original idea of what was in the uh, like initial Japanese show itself. Because no, I, 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 that's kind of like my processing too. I always tr – one of the things I request whenever working on a dubbing show, um, especially a Japanese show, because they're so good and they're so beautiful, I try to stick to what they – the original is so even in the audition i'm like can i hear the japanese like i will always ask i have my headphones on i'll say can i get a little bit of the japanese in my ear and they're like really you don't find that confusing and i'm like no because i can follow the breath of the other original dubbing actor uh, not dubbing the original performance I can I can sense when a when the the lines are going to end. I can match their cadence. I can match their tone. I can match the textures that they use when they speak when they convey emotion. So I like having a little bit of the Japanese in my ear eh, because it makes sure that I maintain what they did originally. <clears throat> and often directors are like, "No, I've had directors say no. You, I don't want you to do that. Forget about the original. I'm going." The original was so good. The original is, it's why we're here recording this show, why it's being dubbed. It's not being dubbed because it's bad. It's being dubbed because it's so good. You should stick to that original thing. So I always try to maintain what, uh, what the original had. And some directors just have like different ideas and how they want to like uh, dub the show. I mean, case in point, look at Power Rangers ever since the- uh, Great the, example. Okay. So, Saban, uh, they, br I guess, cr didn't create Power Rangers, but acquired Power Rangers from the Japanese. And their thing was, we're going to take all of the fight sequences from the Japan, the Japanese show. We'll keep those, and then we'll just install American actors for the talking scenes. Yes. So it was so mm -hmm. successful that they gave Saban the uh the fox kids saturday morning slot which sam and max was on he canceled it so he canceled this really and anybody that watches sam and max is like how like how did this only go for like one season and right why he came in cleaned house wanted a fresh slate and i appreciate that it's from a business point of view he's like he has a vision but at the same time it was like devastating because it was like I just got the show. I think I just quit my Joe job, like my day job, my civilian job, uh, because I was like, oh, I'm working every week doing a show. I can do that. And it, that was a valuable lesson too. You, you know, shows come up and then shows go away and then you're back on the bread line with everybody else. Wow. And, and of course we, we talked about this. We're going to piggy, we, we're going to piggyback what we talked about earlier and you just mentioned it too. And the question I was going to ask you was definitely memories on your time on the adventures of sam and max freelance police as the title character max yes it was i worked with an uh actor named harvey atkin who was a veteran he was he was already old i remember going okay who's this old guy and he had so much wisdom and i learned so much from him because he he was the one that showed me that you got to pace yourself because Sam and Max was an incredibly high energy show. The character Max, very yelly, screamy, fighty, all sorts of things. And I remember he would just be very still. Harvey, who, who played Sam, he would be very still. And when he, you know, it was like, there was a scene, I think where we were attacking, we came across like some food. And it was like pizza or subs or something. And, and so we started, you know, acting, eating. And he, I was like, <laughs> and trying to make every sound and crackle. And he was just like, he got in tight to the mic. I'm getting tight to the mic. That I'm not going to. So. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you don't have to work so hard. <laughs> but I was like, oh. I, you know, I, that was also uh, the realization I had on Sam and Max was that being a voice actor is a little, there's an athleticism to it. If you're not leaving the studio with your pits a little bit wet, a little wet on your brow, you, ha you haven't done it right. 
You should be a little bit like, like it's a workout. Your diaphragm, your, you, you know, the way you're, you know, you're, you're um, reciting your lines. It, 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 there is an athleticism. You have to kind of take care of yourself. And I realized that, okay, I can't drink the night before I do a record. Now, Harvey Atkins, wasn't he the voice of King Koopa on the Super Mario shows? Uh, it's possible. Uh, he did everything. I mean, he, he was around forever. He was a journeyman. Um, yeah, it's possible. Okay. He kind of looked like Super Mario. <laughs> yeah, he kind of looked like, yeah, he, look, he actually looked a lot like Super Mario. And a lot of great shows came out of Canada, too. Like, uh, of course, uh, Pelswick, I believe, came out of Canada. Uh, Ed and Eddie came out of Canada. Uh, undergrads came out of Canada. Undergrads. Uh, I think uh, for, so I think it was called Dino Babies. That was part of the uh, Fox Kids lineup, like, I think on Saturday mornings. There was yep. a lot of great shows, like, and I believe, I think Dennis the Menace, the one with the late great Phil Hartman, actually, was uh, Canadian as well. Yeah, we, we, e, Canada specializes in, in, we do kids television really, really well. America does primetime stuff, big tentpole movies, like no other. But Canada does kids entertainment really, really well. You know what was my favorite one? Bob and Margaret. Oh, Bob and Margaret is so good, right? I love that show. So good. It was like, it was like British almost. It was like, it was, it felt like very British. Um, I don't know if you saw the, it, the, the, the short was either nominated or won an Oscar. for Bob's like, birthday. Bob's short. birthday, right? Oh yeah. Where he comes out naked and he starts complaining about all his friends. What? Yes. And they're all hiding <laughs> behind couches and stuff. Yes, Jeez. I remember that. Yes. <laughs> um, also, like, do you remember that uh, animated show? It showed, like, a bunch of, like, Canadian, like, uh, shorts, like, and uh, animated shorts. Like, I think it was called O Canada. And in O Canada, they had sorts like The Big Snit was one of them. Um, then there was The Cat Came Back, where it was the guy trying to get rid of this cat, and he winds up, you know, killing himself by, like, exploding with dynamite. And then the cat joined him in the afterlife. But now it's, like, nine cats because it's nine lives. Yeah, no, that, those all came out of the... What is it called? The Canadian CFB, the CFB, the Ca Canadian Film Board, the Canadian Film Board, and ah. they sponsor a lot. Even this year, one of the animated shorts that was nominated for an Oscar um, was came out of the uh, the CF CFB, which was a really good short. It's like the whole thing. There was like um, there's a city in uh, in the East Coast uh, called Halifax. And there was an explosion, like around World War One. There was like this warship that came into the harbor, and it hit another ship, and it blew um, up the harbor and blew up, like it killed a bunch of people, blew up a bunch of. But there was one guy who was in the harbor, it was like a sailor, and he got blown uh, like two miles away, and he they found him, no clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> And he survived. He lived to tell about it. It was like he was in the explosion. So anyway, but it's a really guy highly recommended. It, uh, it's in the Oscar shorts this year. I got to Yeah, the C CFB does really good work. Yeah, they de they definitely do. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, memories of working on Cyber Chase as Delete. Memories. Hmm. Let me uh let me think. Uh, the last time I did Cyber Chase was last week because we're oh. still making episodes. This show I've been doing for twenty years. It is a unicorn show. In it was like Arthur, uh, you know, which I was also on. They they just keep making them, and I am bless them for it. Um, <laughs> it's so great that they have continued to make them, um, because now people will come up to me and they'll be like, "You're on Cyber Chase. You were the re like adults. You're the reason I became an engineer." Because it's a math show, right? So it was like they they saw this, like, you know, the kids that watch Cyber Chase. I'm like, oh, you have strict parents. You're the, you, the only, you know, you have to you have to watch like the math cartoon, like <laughs> which is great because it's a good show. But um, those kids go on and do stuff. So they, uh, uh, it's kind of crazy that that I have seen this generation. I've been doing it for so long. I've seen a generation grow up with the show and go on and utilize the things they learned on the show and attained greatness themselves. And which had nothing to do with me because I'm terrible at math. Likewise, that was not my favorite subject growing up. 
<laughs> so I still, we still, we're still making them. There's more coming up. The new season started April 14th this year, and we're on to a new season. So, oh, congrats! Uh, and I believe that was a PBS show, right? Yes. Yep. Because I, I remember watching. There was four shows I would watch as a kid uh, on PBS. Arthur being one of them, which we're going to talk about later, because you actually appeared on Arthur. Yep. Um, there was Arthur, uh, Cyber Chase, Wishbone, and Dragon Tales. Okay. And, and I think uh, you you've heard of Dragon Tales, right? Yep. That was was that Canadian produced as well? I it's possible. I don't know. They spread it. PBS spreads it around. Okay. They, they do spread it around. They come to Canada because it's there's tax rates and things like that, and we can air it and as as well. I don't I don't know what the deal. is. It's not my. That's not. I'm on the creative side of things. I don't really do the business side. But okay. Um. But yeah, there's a lot. I mean, even like PBS, I've been working for a year. I did Cat and Hat, knows a lot about that recently. And like, they're they've been very, very good to me. I love them. That's very good to hear. It's very similar. Like PBS is very. I know it's public television, but it's very similar to a lot of what we create here with the CBC, and it has the same vibe. Cool. And um, you've, of course, you've done video game uh, voiceover work too, and yeah. this is going to lead to Chris's next question. Okay. All right. I remember he's working on the 1999 video game, Dino Crisis. Uh, I remember a lot of screaming, a lot of dying. That was the early days of, uh, of like, first-person, like, video games, where they, they th what was great about Dino Crisis, it, it had, like, you know, all sorts of different levels and versions and, and uh, you know, the, I, I'll, I'd never encountered, I'd done video games before, but I'd never encountered, they're like, here's a list of the 500 ways you have to die. So now you got to die, you're on fire. Now you have to die, you're getting shot. Now you have to die, you're bleeding out. Now you have to die, you're getting suffocated. Now you have to die, you're getting chewed up by a raptor. Now you have to die. And so I remember at the end of those sessions, like my throat would be on fire because I was used to like doing cartoons where it's like, you do it and you maybe do it three times and they're like, great. And then, but with video games, it's like, there's just so many barks you got to do that it's, it, it was, it was very, I remember it being very taxing and learning my lesson and talk about marathon running. You've got to really pace yourself. People that do video games like the, on the regular are, they are athletes. They're like LeBron James, like, the, like athletes. And, uh. Chris, you had a back-to-back -back question, right? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Memories working on the movie, the 2000 movie, The Thomas and the Magic Railroad as Older Patch. As Older Patch. Thomas and the Magic Railroad. I came in and just uh, did my thing and left. It was, I was, I remember, I remember work. I mean, it's crazy to me that I remember working on a session like that. Uh, because it was literally so short. I went in, I did a take, a take, a take. A take, a take, a take, a take, a take, a take, done. And I love those sessions. Some actors get really upset when uh, directors give them line reads and things like that. They're like, that guy gave me a line read. I didn't like it. I'm like, give me the line read. It gets me out of here faster. And it, I mean, maybe because I have another job as a screenwriter, so I can always, I want to get back to my scripts. So it's like, just get like, I'll, and I also want to give people what they want. I will bring what I think this needs uh, and hopefully uh, some unexpected stuff, but uh, tell me what you want. I'll give it to you. Let's get this done. Quick one and done, right? One and done. If I can do one and done. Oh, so happy. <laughs> oh, God bless you, sir. <laughs> uh, of course, one of my favorite projects you did, aside from uh, what we're going to talk about, Pelswick very soon, but one of my favorite shows you did do growing up uh, I was growing up was a Fox family show uh, called Angela Anaconda and yeah. it's very known for its very unique animation style and I want to get your memories on shooting this show as of course Uncle Nicky well we recorded that in a studio that was like the creepy like in the creepiest location it's like the worst neighborhood in, Tor in Toronto and you have to go down this like back alley 
you're like, where am I going here? It's called like Central Hospital Lane or something. Like it's like a we. It's got like a horror movie title. <laughs> like you're like, <laughs> where am I going? And then you go in and you like see this brick building, like very nondescript. And then you go in and you open the door and you're like, oh, it's a studio in here. And it's where they were, where Drake recorded his like first album. And so like the, uh, now I was actually just in that same studio last week. We're doing, we're doing a, an animated film and it's just got such a great vibe. It's just like, it's got creative magic in there. So yeah, it, it, it was, it's always been a little, this studio has always been a little bit magical. Um, we, and we recorded uh, Angela Anaconda there. Yeah, really unique animation style, that <laughs> photorealistic look. It was like the first, the uh, first series that you know utilized those photorealistic black and white photos and made them animated it was like so great it looked so different it was so shocking everybody in the industry it, it, it was beloved in the industry because it just looked so different than anything that had existed before and uncle dicky was a really fun character to play i played also there were other characters i played on that show as well i don't remember the names but there was always like like i said for anybody who wants to get into animation, try to like work on your voice variation, your characterizations, try to make your voice sound different, you know, totally different because that's, uh, that's certainly my bread and butter. Inspirational words. Absolutely, sir. And, uh, I just, I just love that show. Like you said, it was just a unique animation that's never been done before. All the characters faces were blue. I remember they all had blue skin and it, it looked like, it looked like Matt, it, if you cut out like characters in a magazine and then you made animation out of it. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, <laughs> it had an incredibly uh, but but the characters were also so appealing. Like they you just were drawn to them. Like if you were you know, at that time before streaming, if you're like flipping the channels like going you'd stop and you'd go you'd have to stop on it and just like look at it for a minute. It's like those it would just grab you. It grabs uh, the attention. Yeah, yeah. And the voices were great. A lot of really great talented people worked on that show too um and it, here's comes the questions we've all been waiting for at least me and chris uh were waiting for this and i'm sure you were too sir that's the pelswick pelswick questions oh. and um and of course my first question is going to be memories of working on pelswick as pelswick himself um i uh, i loved working on pelswick i loved it immediately i loved the optimism but also that he was just he was he had this dark side to him he was optimistic i can do anything but also um you know would say things like go play in traffic like he was just <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you could get away with it now for sure i don't think you could get away with it now but it was so groundbreaking um but yeah it was like that that balance of like you know sardonic but that's like the creator john callahan he was like that um he he had another another show uh, that he was making with Nelvana at the same time called Quads. And one character had like two hook like hooks for hands, like but really violent looking hooks. And one character was just a head. So that was, I think, the the adult version of. And then it, so I I did a couple of voices on Quads, but then you'd go to Pelswick, which was sort of like sweet, but still had that underlying like you could watch it with adults and they would enjoy it like they're like oh i like this kid um but not in a cutesy like bart simpson mouthy off kind of way just like you know you i think you identified with him i think you um you you you, you felt great empathy for him but then he'd make you laugh too so and there's only two characters I like during that time that I absolutely loved that were just similar. Like they were just kind of similar in characters. And that was your character, Pelswick. And there was a show by Squiggle Vision uh, called Home Movies. And there was a character named Brendan Small played by the actor Brendan Small. And I, love I feel like your characters were very similar when it comes to personalities. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that. That I think that uh, Home Movies came maybe a year, a couple years after, a year or two after. So it wasn't like I took inspiration, but that is so flattering for you to say that. I loved Home Movies. Oh my god. Me too. And, and you know what I actually Coach, had, uh... Coach M McGurk, McGurk. Yes. It's Sean yes. Benjamin, right? Like yes. uh, that's where th that all began. 
It is. And uh, let me get you. I'm going to get my samurai sword. So come here. Like, I was like, oh my God, I love this so much. <laughs> it was Home Movies uh, Canadian produced as well? No. no. Ah. And uh, I was going to say, too, like I recently had, um, you remember the, uh, it was another Squiggle Vision show by the creators of Home Movies called Science Court. I don't remember Science Court. Okay. And oh. there was Dr. Katz, I think, had the same style. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. I love that style. It, yeah, and I just, of course, I'm going to definitely make comparisons between your, your like, Pelswick and Brendan Small because they're both such likable characters with interest and personalities. Like you said, they're kind, but at the same time, they just try to make you laugh. Yep. I, I mean, that's the key, I mean, to screenwriting aficionados out there. That's the key to um, to to a good story is good characters, right? Like characters that you that you like, that you attach yourself to, that you feel for, um, and yeah, they both those shows achieve that. Um, I like to. I'm very happy to have been a part of it. Um, I I know I try to when I approach a new character. How do I? How do I? I want to make, you know, you want the fun part uh, of, of playing characters is sometimes the, the jokes. The jokes are like the chocolate chips and the cookie, but the cookie dough has got to be good. Like you can't have a cookie that tastes like the cookie dough doesn't taste good with, because the chocolate, like, you can't just win. The cookie dough has got to taste good. The, <laughs> the, the main character has to taste good and then the jokes will work. Then the chocolate chips will work. But the whole thing has to work. Yeah, it's like having a, a steak uh, with the onions. You got to give it some flavor, you know? Yeah, you got it. That's exactly <laughs> it. Um, and all, I was going to say, too, like, one thing that was very innovative about Pelswick was the fact that the main character was handicapped. And at, the, at that time, we didn't have an animated show where the main character was handicapped. Yep. And if, you know what, honestly, if I, if that character came across, uh, if my agent called me with that um, uh, character now, I would turn it down. I'd say, go find somebody who genuinely uh, is in a wheelchair, who relate, who there are people that would absolutely love to tell this story. At that time, uh, they didn't really consider those things. Um, and, nor, you know, I didn't even consider, you know, I was just like, oh, here's a character. I'll just play it. Uh, you, you didn't really think about that stuff. But now I really pay atten attention to those things. I go, uh, you should probably find somebody that that is that feels some real connection to this on some level yeah, that's, I, I, like, I mean i i appreciate that I, I i got the opportunity to play it but if they're remaking it you better find somebody who you know is experiencing that themselves because yes. they will truly bring the best work to it yeah who can relate to it yes um chris your question related to pelswick um, so yeah, what were your memories with uh, working with David Arquette? Uh, David Arquette, I worked with once. I met him. I met once, and it was like over the over like phone patch. Like it was over. Like I just heard his voice. Um, it was I think at the first record, and nice guy, friendly. Uh, but it's kind of hard to get to know a person uh, with just a disembodied voice um but it was fun and you know at that time i was pretty distracted because it was the first episode and i think i was still trying to find the character and you know you're you're so worried about what you're doing and that you're bringing the right thing to to your character and making everybody happy um so I, any, you know, any like fanboy feeling I would have had about like meeting David Arquette kind of went away because I was just so worried. <laughs> but um, yeah, he was a cool dude. Really, really nice. Very funny. Very collaborative. Very chill. Hey, want to try that? All right, cool. Let's do it. Like just really, you know, but that was it. As is often the case when you work on a show you maybe do the first episode as a group or even the table read the first episode you'll do as a group and then with successful actors busy actors you're you're so busy that you just end up going into the studio when you you have time available and you go on alone i record in this little studio alone all the time <laughs> oh, okay. on a lot of ensemble shows like on snoopy on on my little pony um 
It's all done in here. I love the back. I love your backdrop. It's kind of like uh, reminiscent of like that grades, you know, like when you're in grade school, like you're in like fourth grade and you've got the backdrop and the guy, the photographer's like drop your chin a little bit, a little smile and you do the fourth smile, but it has that, it has that <laughs> vibe. I liked that. I, I like the color on it. Yeah. Uh, Chris, your uh, follow up. I was actually more of a fan of the laser backdrop myself, oh, but that was like, oh, the laser was say. great. Those were great. Yeah, I want to say that was probably like oh, way back in the uh, the early '90s, late '80s, and unfortunately, yeah, I came too late for those backdrops. Uh, they just went out of style. I don't know why. Yeah, I still I thought they were cool. Yeah, remember glamour shots? Remember at the mall, you go and you'd see the glamour shots, like this, this the storefront. Uh, they would have like you could go get headshots. Why you'd get headshots, I don't know, but it was <laughs> a thing for a little while. But it was all that like la pick your background. It was a laser background. Oh. <laughs> um. So anyway, uh, moving back on to the uh, Pelswick questions. What was your favorite Pelswick line? Uh, could you do it? Could you do it in the Pelswick voice? In the voice? I think it was like, um, okay, well, you know what I think? <laughs> uh, hold on. Let me think about this. Um, I know you sent questions, so uh, I scanned. Um, <laughs> so I think it was like, you know what? This was, this was him to a T. This was like, there are lines that hook in that you say, and you're like, that's that character. And every time I'm going to approach a script, if I go, well, what's happening here? I go back to that line, and it was like, I'm not going to take this sitting down. Well, wait, maybe I am, but that's okay. You know, it was like that. Uh, I loved that optimism. Like, it was like that harsh reality. Op you know, it's like, he said the wrong thing about himself. And the harsh reality sinks in, but he owns it. And then he makes a joke about it. And could laugh at himself, which I really love. Huh. Okay. And uh, I, I do want to ask you, like, your favorite Pelswick episode. My, my favorite, I don't know the name of the title, though, but it was one where this guy is doing a documentary on Pelswick's family. And then when the grandma starts talking, she goes, when I was a little girl. And then the guy goes, nobody cares. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh My favorite episodes consistently are the first episodes because that's where I'm finding the character and that's when it's always really, really fun for me. And that's when I'm, cause I'm, you know, I'm in the studio except when I'm here or I'm watching on zoom and I'm looking at the faces of the producers and, and I love it when their eyebrows come up and they're, they're like, you know, I just love that turning. Cause they're usually, by the time they get to me, they're like, I'm exhausted. Um, you know, stone face, show you nothing. All right, actor, do your little dance. And then when you can get them to like laugh, I love it. I love, and then for the rest of the series, I'm chasing the dragon, trying to make them do that. <laughs> but it's like, there's nothing like that first episode. There's never anything like that first episode. Likewise, you gotta love the pilot, man. Yeah. Um, now, if this is the working with Nickelodeon and met among other uh, ch uh, channels and pro uh, TV uh, shows and stuff like that, uh, you've also worked on Cartoon Network on Time Squad as Larry 3000. Uh, I want to get your memories working on uh, Time Squad. Oh my god. I don't remember. <laughs> There's like it's hard. I I work every week on shows and um you know uh I remember going I've been into Nickelodeon a bunch of times, recorded stuff there, I've done pilots there. I have no memory. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, let me. Oh, I just want to say that I love this show because it was just basically a show about like characters traveling back in time, and one of them was where they travel back to George Washington Carter, and this was the guy that invented many uses of peanuts. And then I find out years later he didn't actually invent peanut butter; he just invented like a thousand uses for peanuts. Oh, interesting. So they got the history wrong. No, well, I got that from American Dad, who actually did the the research about that. But they they made it like George Washington Carver invented peanut butter. So you you were misled by one cartoon and corrected by another cartoon. Yes, years later. <laughs> That's awesome. We, we, and and, and American Dad of all shows. Yes, and ironically, <laughs> you you were in that show too. You you yeah, played just, a guest yeah, star. Yeah, just a guest star. That was like, uh, yeah, that was a that was a few years ago. That was fun. That was that was so interesting because that was. Going into that studio um, was exciting because they did Family Guy and American Dad in the same place. And I, 
I'm on the couch. They had like just couches in the middle of like it was like an office building. Did not feel like a studio recording studio at all. And they had couches. And I think I was sitting between like Patrick Stewart and Bo Bridges. And we're all there to do like a handful of lines on something. And it was just sort of like mind blowing. And then Seth came, Seth McFarlane came in and everybody's like, hi, Seth. And just the energy of the room pumped <laughs> way up. And he was really cool. And then I went into the studio and they had a method of recording lines that I was totally unfamiliar with. It's, I've, I've, I've never seen anything like it since. And that is normally you do this, you, you'll do your scene. If you're with another actor, you'll do your scene. Or you'll do, if you're by yourself, you'll do the scene, just your lines. And you'll do a sequence of three, five, ten lines, twelve lines, twenty lines, sometimes the whole script. And you just go through and then you start at the top of the scene again and do it again. That show, they were like, you went line by line and they gave, they had you do it a million different ways. Okay, now do it angry. Now do it sad. No, 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 they don't worry about the context. Don't worry about what's happening. Do it, now you're yelling it. Now you're drunk. Now you're, they just got every version of the, it was amazing to me. Cause I, I was like, oh, now they have the variety. They can go back and get, you know, insert whatever they want later. It was, it was pretty genius. Is, I've never seen it done since. Is Seth as whimsical in person? I, I didn't really talk to him directly, oh. uh, but he did seem pretty whimsical. <laughs> he, seems, he seems like a real life version of Willy Wonka. Yeah, he kind of, yeah, he is. And it was sort of like he was running the chocolate factory there when he came in. Everybody's like, <laughs> went running to him. It was wonderful. That's so cool. And um, before you ask your next question, Chris, uh, Mr. Tinkler, you've also done, as you mentioned before earlier, live action work. And this is going to lead to Chris's next question, especially we talked about this earlier on in the interview. Yep. So what are your memories shooting Harold and Kumar go to White Castle as JD? So memories of that. Okay, so I was I went in originally to read Billy, who's played by Ethan Embry. And... Uh, I went to the audition and uh, Danny Leaner was there and he, and I was like, I read the script and the scenes were, and I was like, I got, okay, I, I don't really know what to do with this Billy character. Cause he was just kind of the straight guy, like really just very pleasant. And you know, I didn't really know what to do with it, but JD, I knew what to do with it. There were lots of jokes. He was a, he was a jerk. I was like, okay, this I can, I can do. Because I was bullied a lot as a kid, and so I, I mean, I love playing villains, but I always play the people that tortured me as a, as a kid. I'm like, okay, I can play. They're like, how do you play, like, bad guys so well? And I'm like, yeah, because I was on the receiving end of that. So I'm just emulating what they do. Um, but uh, so I asked, I said, can I read this character instead? And he kind of looked at me and was like, Okay, do the Billy, let's do it, and then we'll have you come back in after and do it. The other character. So I did it. And he was like, okay, okay, okay. So then he's like, okay, go out into the waiting room. Uh, we'll uh, and come back in, in in a minute. We'll read. So just like go over the script. I was like, that's fine. So I got called back in, and he was like, that was great. Booked it. Next, next week I was working. We... It was really fun. We shot our first day. The very first thing they had us do, I don't even know, it was like a transition scene where um, after I speak to John Cho and give him like, oh, you got to work for the weekend. Basically, Ethan and I go downstairs to a convertible and we drive around in the convertible doing like donuts in the parking lot. And But they wanted a whole sequence. So they actually had, we shot, I didn't know Ethan. I didn't know anybody. I basically arrived on set and they're like, there's a convertible. And this wasn't really in the script. So like, there's a convertible, get in the convertible and just drive around. But there was a big camera mounted to the front of it. I couldn't see anything over the camera because it was crew. And now that I think of it, nor was I dry. I was dry. I was driving, but they, it was motorized and being pulled by someone else. 
And so it was just very much like, I don't know, it felt like uh, we were making like a, a, one of those old Beatles movies or something like Help or something where we're like, or the monkeys, where we're like crawling, like we're literally crawling all over the car. Anyway, it didn't make it into the, I don't think it made it into the final product, but that was like the very first scene I shot. I was like, oh, this is going to be a lot of fun. So then I shot, uh, we shot the scenes with John Cho, making him work. And then uh, the other, I, there were other scenes uh, throughout. They don't stick, but the White Castle scene at the end, I remember we had to like drive way, they, they, we, drew, we drove way up north somewhere. It, it was like, honestly, it was like a three hour drive up north. Um, which there's not much you, you, three hours north of Toronto. There's, there's not too much. Um, and, but they had converted this old gas station into a white castle. So it was like on the outside, it was this old rundown gas station, but inside, which is where it mattered, it was a white castle. They had the white castle wallpaper and then the booths and everything like that. And that was the, uh, yeah, I remember like my character was so bad, but I, I had to warn my scene partners ahead of time. Like, okay, I'm going to say mean things. I'm sorry, my character's mean. I'm going to say mean things. And they were like, that's cool. Uh, everybody was pretty cool about it, but um, it was fun. I like playing villains. I, I really love playing villains. So you prefer playing villains over the protagonist, right? I don't necessarily prefer it. I just love it. I love... Uh... The freedom, right? Yeah. Yeah, you just get to play, you know, on camera a lot. I mean, I don't do on camera anymore. This is my on camera. Um, I got, you know, I, I put it like this. This is the reason why I don't do on camera anymore. I got bitten by the acting bug. I was super excited about it. And then I kind of got cured of it. Um, you you sort of, uh, and, and I discovered screenwriting, which scratches a different creative itch and is uh, like so interesting to me. But I do love still doing vo i love doing voices and so that allows me to play and indulge in all sorts of different characters and also i'm not on set for 18 hours a day which i love i'm in the studio for a half hour an hour and then i'm done it's great and then i can get back to writing do you prefer um live acting uh voice over or uh, screen screenwriting oh Voice, so I, well, I don't know. It's between voice and screenwriting. I love writing. I love writing. Me too. Yeah, and uh, Chris, you had a follow up with that, right? That question. I'm getting them cross legged out. Well, yeah, we definitely had a lot of guests on here who had their own expressions about how they've enjoyed playing the villains as well. Uh, and yeah, a lot of it just comes from freedom of like being the villain as well as the layers there in the villain themselves. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, moving on to, like, my next question with one of your other works. Uh, what are your memories working on Totally Spies as Arnold? Oh, wow. Yeah, Totally Spies. Um, I was actually just talking to one of the other actors that I worked with on that show, Katie Griffin, who played one of the spies. Uh, we were just reminiscing about uh, that show, and uh, I think it's coming. They're doing another version. It's coming back. Yeah. But um, Arnold was great. I mean, he was just the typical nerd, uh, it, which is always fun to play. You know, it's always fun to play heightened characters like that. Um, I I always think of them as heroes in their own mind. Everybody's 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 a hero in their own life, in their own story. They're always the protagonist in their own life, and so. The mistake a lot of people make when they approach a nerdy character is like, oh, like, I'm going to play him like he's a he's a dork. And they're already looking down on the character that they're about to play. And I never approach a character like that. I'm always like, this character is, you know, come at it much more earnestly. He, he wants to succeed. Um, you know, he thinks he's the hero. Meanwhile, the spies are the hero. The girls are the heroes. Uh, but he he thinks he's, and not in a in a in a braggadocious, assumptive way. Like just like um, just earnest, keen and you know in his own life. But it was fun. I worked with a producer named David Michel on that, and then he's been very kind to me over the years. And I've worked on 
many other projects of his. Most recently was a fe feature film called Around the World in 80 Days, um, which was a really fun show, co-production with France. Um, and, I, you know, it, it did get <laughs> released. It was released in the States. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm sure it didn't get as wide as a Pixar movie, but uh, it was a good little movie. If you can find it, check it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have any particular opinion of the uh, uh, Totally Spies reboot or revamp they might be doing? Uh, you know what? I I I feel like everything's a reboot, isn't it? Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> We're in the it age. Has, it has a built-in. It makes sense. It has a built-in audience. It has familiarity, like familiarity. It has that, like you know, like if if somebody, you know, if a. Sh I like original pr properties too. There's been a lot of incredible original properties um, that have been made into movies and shows, and and I love those. But I, I understand why they do the re reboot thing. It's got that built-in audience, and you 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 want to give them more. I definitely find myself more compelled to watch revivals because they're more of a continuation of the original story. And yeah, you know what you're you know what you're getting. Yeah, and when they did a like revival of the Jurassic Park series of sorts, uh, it kind of actually had its own allure right there because uh, we know like how the initial series ended. Instead of a reboot, they continued the story and they uh, they give us something that's a little bit different from what Hollywood's already been giving us. Yeah, it it's it works. I mean, and I who knew that there was more stories to tell uh, with that? I mean, they really. They put those dinosaurs, they found different things for the dinosaurs to do. And then the last one, they're like running around in like Europe somewhere. I'm like, oh my God, like I, this is hilarious. They're in, they're in Malta or something like that. It's like <laughs> dinosaurs in Malta. Uh, they, they, you know, they came up with it. They found, they found the story. Indeed. Um, so, um, let's move on to the next question though. Sure. Um, what are memories working on Brace Face as Griffin? Um, brace, brace face. That was, I know brace face was, a uh, was, what was it with, who played that? Alicia, um, oh, I have to look Sil it up. Silver's, what's her name? You know, Clueless. I, I know the, a the actress, I just Alicia Silverstone? Her. Alicia Silverstone? Alicia Silverstone? The, yeah, that Alicia sounds right. Silverstone. Yeah, yeah. She did the first season. And then another character, another uh, actor came in, Stacy DePass, who I was in a sketch comedy troupe with at the time. She took over, and she does like the best Alicia ever. Like you can barely tell the difference. Um, so it was her show at that time, because I think by the time I came on, it was like second or third season. So it was her show. So uh, I just showed up, and I just enjoyed playing with um, my. Uh, comedy troupe buddy it was it's you know when you're on a show when you do something like that and then you're um on a show together working together in another context it's always so fun but i will say this uh there is nothing like working on something that you have created yourself that that was uh a, an eye-opening thing for me because i you know after i quit my job after when i got sam and max and i quit my job my joe job uh it, I that summer I did not work at all and I was like oh my god I gotta pay rent and I started a comedy troupe with some friends and we started getting gigs and you know but it was like all about that hustle but in the end and then we we got a, a show here in Canada we got a show and it came down to the states did live shows but there was nothing so satisfying. I just went, oh my God, when you create it, when it's your thing, when it's your idea and it comes to life, it's like the best feeling. Uh, yeah, it's like better, better. I mean, look, there are shows that you work on like Sam and Max. I'm like, oh my God, this is like the best. But when you, the second best is like working or no, it would be tied for best is working on your own stuff. And um, before you ask the next question, Chris, uh, both Chris and I, Mr. Tinkler, are huge fans of claymation animation. And that's going to lead to Chris's next question. 
What were your memories on working on MTV Celebrity Deathmatch? Celebrity Deathmatch. I remember getting that. I was living in LA at the time. I got the audition and it was like, Celebrity Deathmatch, we need a Jake Gyllenhaal impression. <laughs> what does Jake Gyllenhaal sound like? I wish I could tell you. Think about his voice. You've seen him in movies. You've seen him in, you know, did you see uh, Sp Sp uh, Spider-Man Far From Home? He played uh, Mysterio. Um, he And that's a send-up. Like, that's it. When, when, when an actor plays sort of a heightened version of themselves where they're evil, it's like, you know, they're a little easier to hook in, but there, it, there was nothing at that time. It was Tobey Maguire. That was the fight. Tobey Maguire versus Jake Gyllenhaal, who were both... The subtext was competing for the role of Spider-Man. Toby Maguire got the role of Spider-Man. I was playing Jake Gyllenhaal. Was super jealous of Toby Maguire. So that's why there was a celebrity death match between us. So I remember going, "What the hell does Toby Maguire, uh, or sorry, not Toby Maguire, Jake Gyllenhaal sound like?" I, I think I like downloaded Jarhead or something like that, and I and I I remember like. Luckily, I had uh, the audition was uh, my agent sent it to me and I just recorded it in my own studio. So I was like literally playing a clip of Jake Gyllenhaal and then like trying to like cap capture his voice, sort of like that subtle thing that he had. And then reading the line and matching it that way. When I booked it, I was shocked and scared because I was like, I'm going to. I, I, what did I do? And I still don't know what Jake Gyllenhaal sounds like. So I I didn't know what I, and I'm playing my audition and I'm like, I don't hear it. I don't, I don't get Jake Gyllenhaal from this. Uh, so I remember going to the record and, and going, okay, this is what I did. And sort of like trying to like capture it again, but thinking the whole time they're going to recast, like there's no way. But I guess not many people can do a Jake Gyllenhaal, so I was the closest thing to it. But it was it was fun to do. What was uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's uh, reaction towards uh, your portrayal of him? Did I you... have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh... But if I meet him, I will say, you know, I played you once. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to see that. <laughs> I know, right? Um. Now, of course, we we're gonna piggyback onto another question too. Um, of course, you worked on Arthur, as we mentioned. Um, memories on working with Arthur. Uh, any funny behind the scenes stories you can share? And was C Arthur a Canadian produced cartoon? It was a Canadian produced cartoon. It's a Canadian book. The Mark Canadian Brown. Author. Uh, was Mark so, Brown? Yeah, I I don't um, I don't know. Okay. I have a book coming out. We have the same publisher, Kids Can Press, and um, it uh. Yeah, I think it was acquired, but maybe maybe it was a, a global phenomenon by the time they made the show. Um, I was sad when it ended. It was like one of those shows that I played like, I don't know, a bunch of different characters. My favorite was Rapti, um, the dinosaur. But um, yeah, it, it was directed by the same director who directed me in Sam and Max Freelance Police, Deborah Toffin, who I always had a really good re working relationship with. So it was, you know, but pretty, you know, at the end of the day, doing voiceover is, it can be boring. <laughs> it can be boring. <laughs> it seems very exciting. You're playing all these exciting characters, but even like, it's so funny. It's like very run of the mill now. Like I'll go, you know, I'll be playing a villain. Like we have to take over the world. And then uh, I'm like, did you get it? Like you drop it. Did you get it? Again? Oh, it, it popped. All right. I've got to take over the world! We good? All right. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. See you later. It's just very, like, punch the card, chook, and away you go. Huh. Yeah, I know. Am I, am I taking some of the magic out of it? No, I, <laughs> you're, you're being totally honest and blunt. I love it. <laughs> um, Of course, uh, Chris, you had another question, right? Uh, Yeah. Memories of working on Beyblade as Ginka. Jinka. Oh yeah, that was great. I loved uh, 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 Jinga Hagane. Um, I lo I loved it. Um, oh, Jinga. Jinga, yeah, I loved him. He was a great character. So much emotion. That is a character where I listened to, I insisted on listening to his the original actor's voice. 
and I always had it playing in my ear. And I would, you find that actors, it's more obvious with, with uh, bigger actors. Like if you take like, say a Christopher Walken, right? Like with someone who has a very specific way of speaking, like Jeff Goldblum, you've, you've probably heard people do impersonations yes. of it or, or, you know, or um, you, you can follow their breathing pattern. You can follow their speech pattern, but actors have that too. And they're not necessarily aware of it. And that's probably a good thing. But when you're playing somebody, when you're dubbing some another character uh, that was originally performed by another character by another person, then you want you you want to pay attention to those things like their breathing pattern. You can match it, and you'll 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 find the energy matches, and then it blends, and then you'll find that the lip sync works really really well. One of like the wor like the first memories I have watching cartoons was i don't even remember what show it was but it was for sure an uh, uh like a japanese show that was dubbed and i remember going that doesn't match that lip that those lips don't match the mouth like the mouth was flapping too fast for what he was saying or the 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 what they would they how they would fill the the dialogue at the end they'd add like a weird laugh like all right we've got to go ha 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 you know, they, they would do just to make it fit the mouth movement. And I, it makes me furious. And so now when I approach a dubbing show, I'm so fussy that I'm like, this has to fit. And if it doesn't, I will, I will self-direct. I'll be like, stop, I'll do it again. Let me do it again. I can get it. I can get it. And I count mouth flaps and I, you know, but it's, I've been doing it so long that, you know. Yeah. That you want it perfectly. Safe. Yeah. yeah. I want it to, I want it to match. I just want it to match so badly. And Jason uh -huh. Point, just like probably any anime that was done by four kids. Right. Oh, yeah. And um, before we ask the next question, though, uh, we have a – he's a co-host of ours. Uh, his name is Kwame. He's a friend of mine and Christopher's. He's a big fan of your uh, work and, uh, of course, Beyblade. Uh, he asked me specifically if you can give him a shout-out using uh, the, Ginkha name, uh, the Ginkha voice. Uh, to Kwame? Yes, to Kwame. Uh, okay, I hope my, I don't blow up my mic. Okay, Kwame, let it rip! Uh, thanks, man, for being a fan. That's so nice. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, um, the next question I have for you, and this is one of your major works as well, and that is memories on working on the Snoopy show as Woodstock. Woodstock, okay. So the original uh Woodstock voice was it was done. Snoopy and Woodstock were both done by the same guy. And uh, he was also the producer, animator, Bill Melendez. Forgive me, I might be wrong. <laughs> but I think it was Bill Melendez. Anyway, they, they, wanted a, they wanted a very clear voice match that's, so that it sounded exactly the same. And so they, uh, uh, Woodstock and Snoopy are both sp uh, sped up. They're recorded. And then they, back in the day when it was tape, they would speed up the tape. So it was like, <laughs> so I'm not impersonating the, I'm impersonating Bill Melendez and he's going, boop, 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 cheap, 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 cheap. So I'm doing an impersonation of Bill Melendez. He was like a 60 year old man. And then they, they tried to match it but then with the, the great thing about working on snoopy show with apple uh apple plus is that they they let me bring my own thing to woodstock which is uh like i do this trilling and now woodstock uh will make like you know if he's like he'll make like little sounds and be like a little jackhammer like like they have me do sound effects and things like that which i like one of my favorite things to do, I love doing scripted stuff, but I really love, my favorite characters are often the ones that I don't have any dialogue. I'm on a show on Netflix now called Alien TV that is all complete uh, gibberish. It's, I say, meep, boop, meep, 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 we have conversations, and the aliens always, they discover some object on Earth, like a mug, like a set of headphones, like a mannequin, and they will figure out their interpretation of it. So 
the great thing about working on that and uh, Snoopy Show, Woodstock, PJ Masks, the, doing the uh, Ninjalinos, uh, the, doing Thing 1 and Thing 2 on Cat in the Hat knows a lot about that. They, they, th their dialogue, I'm writing it as I go along. I'm improvising the dialogue, adding emotion, adding context, and also trying to do interesting acrobatics with my voice. I love it. It's so fun. You mentioned PJ Masks, uh, though. Like, uh, uh, what was it like working on that show? PJ Masks is great. It's uh, it's so funny and surreal, and it was on. It's on Disney. Or was on Disney. Is on Disney. They're doing a. They're doing. Oh, they're doing something. I can't mention it, but they're doing something. But um, I, one of the most surreal things was like, uh, I'm with. I'm at Disney with my kids, and we're watching. PJ Masks on Disney, and I'm like. Oh my God, I'm at Disney watching a show that I'm do on the Disney Channel. And my kids, my children were watching and they were like looking at me and then looking and they're like, that's daddy. Like they knew they could identify, even though I'm like, they they knew they're like that's daddy it was just it was just like a really sort that's not related to the making of it's more like the finished product but it was pretty it was a pretty cool feeling that's awesome especially that your kids are like that's daddy that's like one of those big awe moments it's like just so cool yeah heart right woman. it's very heartwoman yeah totally uh chris before oh, you, what was you gonna say? oh well i was uh yeah gonna ask Go uh, um so well, you mentioned you worked on my little pony so so what were your memories um, of working on My Little Pony as uh, Sparky, a Sparkaroni? Sparkaroni. Um, again, another character who has no lines, uh, who, uh, you know, follows a character, hitch around, uh, and tries to do everything he does, and um, is always burping fire. Um, it's a lot, of, it's fun. It's, it's a really, it's very heart, uh, heartfelt. It's got an incredible fan base. The fans love the show. The fans are so supportive. They love the character. They reach out. I love when people reach out. It's so nice. Um, and, uh, it's, yeah, it's just such a wonderful show to work on, uh, having a show that has such a like a b beloved fan base is like it's there's nothing like it it just means so much to them and then you're just like oh my god this this is amazing like you you just you you feel the joy we have a couple of questions before we wrap up um one of them is i'm a, now and it's a question i ask every single guest i have on this show whenever i'm not on a military almost like diet i am an absolute foodie and I know you worked on many big voiceover production companies and a lot of production companies in general. So I was just curious, uh, curious to know what was the what was your uh, which cater which production had the best catering scene and what was your favorite meal in catering? My favorite meal in catering. I worked on a Jackie Chan movie called The Tuxedo. Uh, that had the best craft table, uh, the best catering. The craft table was the best. It was like lobster. Um, it was uh, it was pretty decadent, and Jackie was always eating. Uh, he was constantly eating, and the reason why he constantly ate is because I mean he was always doing stunts, so it was always like he was always like he'd be like the director would come up, give him notes. Somebody would come up with a little cup of something, he'd be like eating, mm -hmm, chewing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then he'd go eat. So that's how he sustained that the energy to do that. Speaking of athletes, um, so that was the best craft table for sure. Um, Mm, yeah, I'd say that that's, yeah. In voiceover, the craft tables, there's one studio in Toronto, Supersonics, that they always have a good spread and their spread, but their spread is always like berries. It's always like they have this like huge, massive plate of berries, which are really great because they're light. They don't sit to it because some food, you don't want to eat like a sandwich because then you get all gluey. And then, like, your voice gets all garbled and stuff like that. You need something clean, light, but that gives you a little burst of energy. And, and so that's – from. but from a voiceover perspective, that's good because they don't – usually it's like, here's your room temperature water. Go into the studio and uh, say your lines, and then you leave. Hmm. Fascinating. 
I've never seen the tuxedo, and I'm probably going to have to add to my watch list. Yes, me too. Uh, it's it's a little known movie. It's 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 good. Uh, directed by Kevin Donovan, who I met doing commercials. He was a commercial director, and he was a very loyal uh, director who he worked with a bunch of actors commercially, and he just loved us all. And then when he got this big tentpole movie, he brought us all in on it. And I was like, thank you. Um, just a really sweet guy. Mentioned voiceover directors too, like I and I want to know if you uh, had worked with this gentleman too. I've had on my show a gentleman who is a voice actor and a voice director, Pat Fraley, um, and I was just curious to know, like, if you ever worked with him because, like, whenever I, like doing this interview with you, like, I, you guys have the same philosophy on like voiceover works, and that's why I was just wondering if you guys work together. No, but you know what? It's funny. You'll find there was um, there's a documentary on. Uh, I can't. I think I saw it on Netflix. It's like I. I think it's on. It's on voiceover. It's on. Um, I think it's called "I Know That Voice," and they. A lot of them, the actors, they brought well-known actors, uh, voice actors. Um, they started talking about how there's a musicality to this. A lot of voice people are good singers, are good at, you know, or not good singers, but like earnest singers or understand music on some level or like singing. And I was like, I've been doing that for years. That is my, that is what, absolutely, I do that. I totally do that. I'm yelling at my, I'm sitting with my spouse and I'm like, I totally do that. She's like, great, you totally do that. Sit down. Um, <laughs> but it was amazing to see because I hadn't really heard it put within like in that context i'd only thought it i'm like oh it's like different music notes you just kind of sing the line right you sing it and um yeah to hear that back i was like oh so you'll i think a lot of people that succeed in the industry they do they have a lot of whether they talk about it or not they do a lot of those same things if any of your listener viewers listeners out there that um that want to break into the industry i always tell them like yeah, you can take acting classes, you can take like cartoon classes, but I first thing I would do is singing classes. First thing. Cuz that's how you get used to your voice. That's how you get used to the sound of your voice. That's how you get voice control, breath control, your range. Yeah, that's how you hit the high notes. That's how you can play kids by hitting way high notes or play evil villains by bringing your voice down low. But always start with the music. And it just seems to work. You have to be a good actor too. I'd say maybe do improv classes too, you know, to, to better understand comedy, to grow your confidence, to grow your courage, to get used to making an idiot of yourself in front of an audience, um, but just trying stuff um, and playing and being playful. Oh. And uh, so basically, like, would you say that if you can sing in the, if you can sing and uh to, like act then you can basically do anything in the voiceover industry yeah yeah i think you can but i i wouldn't say like not all the successful voiceover people i know are singers they're not like brilliant singers i think they're just i think they're unafraid i think that's the common thread they're not scared of sounding stupid they're not afraid of of they're not self-conscious or they they save their self-consciousness for outside of the studio. When they're in the booth, they're not at all self-conscious. They're like, just playful. Let's play. Just have fun. Cool. Now, here's also a good technique. So if you have like an audition or something like that, and you're feeling nervous, right? Um, you get butterflies in your stomach. You're like, oh my God. Uh. You're listening. You got your headphones on and you hear your own voice. You hear your own breath and you're like, because ah, as you get in the mic, you hear it and it freaks out. This is This is a surefire anti like n nerve nervousness diffuser so when i was a kid and my dad would come home friday and i'd be like tired he'd be like all right we're gonna order pizza and me and my siblings would all go like we'd rub our hands together i don't know if you did this as a kid you're like yes ee, ee, yes that was me right? <laughs> yeah like ee, 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 you rub your hands that e feeling that when you rub your hands emulates nervousness they're very similar in your physiology so if you're this is excited. I want pizza. Eee, I can't wait. Nervous is, I don't want to get me out of this situation. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Uh, I get me away. But if I go nervous energy, eee, 
Now I want to participate in what's happening. I've tricked myself. I do that. I did that. All I, and I still do that. If, you, if there's something, if I got to give a speech or something like that, I spoke at my buddy's wedding, I'm like backstage going, because I'm nervous. Because I'm like, oh, this is very serious. This isn't goofy. This is some people getting married. I got. I can't mess this up. I got to say heartfelt things. I got to say nice things. And 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 there's like adults with you know the you know and parents and ah like that's that's stress. But I just I'm, I'm using my acting technique in real life. But it is a great next time you're nervous about something, that energy transfer of like turning the nervous into into excitement. Then you tell you you have to tell yourself, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Use it, using the voice acting uh, techniques and tips in real world in real life situations. Yes, they are applicable. Yes, <laughs> they they do are. apply. I also go every day. I won't say where I go, but I go. And I get like a, a, um, I get like a like a tea, right? But I have a very specific order for this tea at the drive through. And every time I pull up, I use my voice skill. I read it. I I I say it a very specific way with a certain musicality, and they know. They're like, "Hey, Rob, they know me." So there I've applied that they know, because I don't think I have a very distinctive voice. Like I don't have like a, I don't, like, I don't have like a voice of God that you're like, oh my God, that guy's voice is so distinct. I, I think I probably have a similar voice print to both of you guys. It's kind of a, not a really sort of generic, but it's what you do with it. So if you give a very specific read every day to your food order, they get to know you. And then you get your order really, really quick because they know, you know, they don't see me. Because it's all through drive through. It's all audio. Yeah. yeah, it's all audio. So that's that's another way you can apply it. That's a very useful tip. Here's a useful tip from Rob Tinkler. Love it. Um, the one of the uh, the final question we have for you, and that is, what's next for Rob Tinkler? Now, this is the part, Mr. Tinkler, where all my guests are. This is an open forum. You can talk about. You can say. You can you can talk whatever you want. Totally unfiltered. I am passing the proverbial microphone on to you. Over to me. Yes, Over. I'm going to give it to you right now. And the floor is yours, Mr. Tickler. Well, uh, it, during COVID, I started uh, getting into podcasting. Um, I w had my kids at home uh, with me. They were you know, uh, doing school. And I was like, this is brutal, <laughs> but I'm looking for projects because we couldn't do anything, couldn't go anywhere. So we did a little podcast together just as an experiment. I'm like, maybe they'll be into it. Maybe they won't. I've never, ever tried to force what I do onto them, even though I'm like, this is your moneymaker. You should learn how to do this, but they don't, I, don't, I want them to pursue what they're going to pursue. Right? Like I want them to be happy. So it's like, uh, you know, like maybe you're interested, maybe you're not. So, but in that process of doing that, it was like so fun. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do more of this. So I wrote, uh, I had an original, I had an idea for a feature film. And it's hard to make a film, uh, an animated film during, you know, shutdown. So I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to use all my friends and record it. And uh, I have the means. I have actors. I, you know, the script is written. I have a studio who's willing to do special effects on it and stuff like that. So I did this uh, podcast. It was called Eight Tiny Reindeer. It was a Christmas podcast. It was done in 24 episodes. So it was like an advent calendar in that it was like every day through the month of December, I released it. Anyway, uh, Kids Can Press, the publishing company that they published Arthur, they discovered it. And then they were like, we would like to publish this as a graphic novel. I'm like, great. So now hopefully I have storyboards for a movie, <laughs> but I'm excited about the graphic novel that's going to be coming out. Um, and now I'm, I'm doing more podcasting. So I have five podcasts going narrative, a sketch comedy podcast. I have a meditation podcast. If you want to chill out uh, called imagination meditation, but you can find them all at herocomplex.ca. Uh, yeah. So check it out. Uh, and I have a feature film that's coming out that I was recording this week, but I can't mention it. So I'll have to come back on your show and talk about it when it's, when it comes out, when it's released, but it's like, it's going to be really good. You're more than we happy to have you back on and yes, you can probably we, formulate more questions. We yeah, can, you're very questions. welcome to come back on anytime you want, Mr. Sinclair. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are great. I love this show. I love your enthusiasm. Um, yeah, it's so great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. And like, thank you. Uh, uh, and before we say our final comments, though, let me just say uh, thank you for not only an amazing interview you gave us uh, today, Mr. Tinkler, but you have this incredible gift 
and I'm going to sound like a broken record when I say this, but you have this incredible gift where you can take a 30-something-year-old fan and bring him way down here and make him feel like that 11-year-old again watching Hellswick. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> that, that warms my heart. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you saying that. That's that's why I do it. Thank you, sir. And also, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you like an email, uh, a copy of this interview as soon as I'm done editing it. But I'm sure. also going to send you the screenplay because I, I, I would be super honored to, and totally yeah. value your constructive criticism and feedback on it because I, as, a write, as a guy who loves to write myself, I just want to know like, how, like if this is good, if the plot's good, if the swerves are good, if the elements, the character development's good. In fact, um, I'll tell you right now a little elevator pitch of it. Is, is that sure. okay? Hit me. Okay. So the elevator pitch is basically you have four of the most dangerous villains uh, in Power Rangers. Um, and I believe they were from Time Force, Ninja Storm, and Lost Galaxy. The main villain from Time Force travels back in time to the past and in the future to grab the main villains from those respective seasons and to con continue with continuity. They form this evil alliance, which I've coined the term fashionably evil. Because they're, they're villainesses... Uh, and they are like they they're evil, but they believe they love fashion. If that makes any sense, it's kind of like uh, uh, like Cruella de Vil. Yeah. And they take over, and not only do they take over, but they you know turn on the original uh, evil leaders of their respective seasons, and they take their foot soldiers with them, so that so they have a combined foot soldiers uh, just to rule the world. And then the main protagonist, and this is where things get a little bit you know interesting. Uh, I called the group called the Brotherhood of Wrestling, and the Brotherhood of Wrestling, in Power Rangers, you have high school martial artists. Here, it's uh, college pro wrestlers that have jobs now, uh, and and I don't want to spoil it for you, but I'm just going to say that the characters are based on, like, real things. And, of course, there's a character named Chris. Obviously, I based it on my friend over here, and mm -hmm. there's another character who's a... A caricature of myself his name is cody because i'm not going to use my real i'm not going to use pd because then it's just too obvious right um so I, I came up with the character cody and it just leads to this you know brotherhood versus sisterhood type Ooh. thing which leads to a winner takes all match kind of like freddy versus jason oh wow and that's why i'd be so honored for you to read this script um because i just want to get your thoughts on it like what you think like you know the pros the cons you name it Send it, man. I, I love it. No, send it to me. I'm very happy to read. Thank you. And uh, before we wrap up, uh, Chris, do you have any final comments for Mr. Tinkler? I mean, I also have a bit of a fan fiction myself that I wouldn't mind sending your way. It, it was uh, a, a pretty much a sequel to an episode uh, that was uh, something that ended on a cliffhanger. Right? And you may not know the show. It aired on UPN back in 2001. It was called Gary and Mike. Okay, and they were pretty much being chased by the police. I actually reached out to the directors themselves, and they told me that they were supposed to land on a boat or something, as they like drove off, sub Selma and Louise style, into oh. the Mississippi River. Okay, and I just sort of follow up along the way with that they land on the boat. But uh, their car is pretty much grounded on the boat, so they gotta like make their way into the river and start swimming for it and get into a sewer pipe uh, just to try and like lose the sight from the cops because they're being pursued by Chopper. And we also gotta keep in mind that they could just dispatch boats along the way as well. And after that, epic! Like it sounds like there's a lot going on there. <laughs> Are yeah. you giving me the beats? Are you giving me the plot beats? Or are you giving me the... Like, is is that the whole... Like, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the plot beats. And they're getting away from the police. And after that, they also, like, reminisce about what had happened and that led them up to where they were. So we do a flashback segment. And then we also fast forward back to the present. And they end up meeting up with a guy who... It ends up uh, finding out that and they were also, like, framed by the same guy uh, who, who nearly murdered Gary's father. Right? And uh, Gary ended up being framed for killing the guy's wife. Oh, my God. It was uh, Strangers on a Train kind of plot okay. that happened okay. in the last episode. Okay. 
that's a, that's a very useful tool when you're just as a quick sidebar when you're pitching it something that you've written if you if you use like a reference that exists like strangers on a train uh like you did with strangers on a train, i it gives context i know exactly tonally where things are at and then you can start into your story but if you start with that then it helps people go rrr, start to think in terms of the mindset that you had when you're writing it so that helps with pitching but continue sorry i didn't mean to stop you i didn't mean to break your flow yeah okay so well i would actually start the, uh, the episode itself with a flashback of recasting or recanting the uh, yeah the story that have happened so far right? and i would also like uh, do various highlights of what happened in the cliffhanger episode uh, mentioned that uh, it had that strangers on the train context uh, i would also make it a period piece because it's supposed to set in 2002 which right. is one year right after crazy the... that that's a period piece now 2002 is a period piece yes that's crazy to me <laughs> and, and so anyway hey, we have to like uh, look towards uh, some way for gary and mike to somehow prove their innocence uh, and at the same time, also live life on the lamb. And I would end the episode itself uh, with them taking a ride down to Mississippi, where they would meet up with Mike's old college roommate, who would actually turn out to be now a transvestite. And Mike actually had a bad experience with a transvestite when they had gone to Hollywood. Hmm. And this would also call on to, I guess, question of his contemporary transphobia. Hmm. But we would also look towards uh, maybe looking at the trans community in a more positive light because uh, this is someone who can actually help them. Hmm. That but sounds... uh, that's what I have so far. That's that's uh, That sounds really like a big story. That's a lot of story. And it's a one hour, half hour, 40, 44 minutes. What is it? Ideally, I wanted to like try and break it down into a 22 minute episode, similar to what they would already have. And, but on the other hand, that's, if it uh, would be like maybe a special, I could make it longer. That's stick with the format that they have. Because if you break, because if you want to sell, like if you're thinking of using it as a spec script or if you're going to use it to perhaps even, you know, to get it made or whatever. Um, Try stick as closely to the format that they have. Like, if you're doing, this is really good advice that I got uh, from the uh, showrunner of The Office. M m when you when you when you're doing a show that's when you're doing a spec or of an existing show, try to stick to the format that they have, the length that they have, but don't. Just, you know, and and I think you've succeeded in this. In in that, you show the characters in a different way, show them in a different way, show them doing something that is somehow different, but still within the realm of who those characters are. Um, but that sound for a twenty-two minute episode, that sounds like a lot, but that's okay because it's almost better to overwrite because it's always easier to cut than it is to 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 fluff up something that is a little light on story. So. What what I find useful is if you lay the beats out, watch an episode. I, this is like my this is my sad pastime. Sometimes, I will watch a movie or a show, and I will have a pen or just even my notes on my phone, and I will make the bullet points of every scene, and I will count the scenes. How many scenes are in this twenty two minute episode? Twenty two minute episode is probably like fifteen scenes, fifteen eighteen scenes you know uh so uh if if your concept that you're you're doing for your spec is has like 28 scenes you're going to be long if it's like if there's like eight scenes you're going to be short so if you use that because you want to kind of capture i mean i think even if it's just fan fiction the fans will will like it because it feels familiar and you're obviously a fan of the show and you want it to 
to to express that fandom. So yeah, I but I find it very useful to do bullet points of the of an, of your favorite episode. Choose your favorite episode. Do bullet points of that episode, and then do bullet points of your episode, and try to like match it out. Like literally, shows will have the same. Like on page five, we're we're at like we're at our act the character the 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 main problem has been established and the the heroes start out on on their journey to fix it by page five every it doesn't matter what show it is like by breaking bad does this and breaking bad was probably every episode was so unique but they they're loyal to that structure they were loyal to that structure structures everything so um if you kind of look at that that's a good place that's a good starting point um that's what i would do um uh but yeah it sounds it sounds like a a a big a big story but i but you did mention like flashbacks right so like maybe maybe it will be more compressed with the flashbacks but i don't know uh chris are you there He's, he froze froze well <laughs> well um i hope i bored him i froze him <laughs> Well, uh, I froze him with my advice. What have I done? <laughs> um, uh, let me say, like, it's back. Also, like, oh, yeah. can you hear me? Uh, barely, Chris. <laughs> That's just the signals. That's yeah, you're losing your signal. Uh, well, I, I gotta ask, uh, to uh, Mr. Tinkler, like, what I do for can my can you hear me still? Yeah, <laughs> yes, we can hear you. I'm afraid okay. this is something. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, I was just trying to say that, uh, yeah, there's definitely flashbacks, uh, and it's pretty much also callbacks to previous episodes uh, where uh, they sort of just uh, lead up to, like, where they are right, and uh, how just uh, Gary and Mike just came to, uh, like, where they were at uh, because in the context of the show, uh, they are both on the run from, like, uh, two people in who are, are, I guess, uh, plaguing their life. In this case, Gary's sort of on the run from his father, who wants to send him up for the Marines. And because uh, this is 2002, and he uh, he supposedly thinks that Gary is gay, and there was also, like, a pretense to where uh, he wanted him to become uh, a man in his eyes when he was supposed to, like, go on the Lewis and Clark Trail alone. Uh, wow. And... Yeah, Mike is also on the run from this uh, psycho renegade cop uh, who uh, is furious with him for betting his daughter on her wedding day. Wow. Yeah. So That's it's a, a comedy lot. show. Yes, it's a big adventure. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's an, uh, Mr. Tinkler, I was going to ask you too. Like, um, I I'm going to send you the, uh, the script though. Like 120 pages as a professional script writer though. 120 pages is how many like hours would you say that's like an hour and 30 minutes uh well 120 minutes it's usually a minute a page that's the standard if you're using courier 12 point courier font on your yeah. script i would yeah. use like screenwriting software because if you don't if you have new times roman at 11 points your your a producer is going to read that script and going to go is this a minute a page? How long is this movie? They trust 12 point like courier font. They know that, and there are, there are softwares. There's, I don't know, do you use a screenwriting software or do, or do you just do it all on Word? Actually, yeah, I was using, um, I wanna see if I have it though. It was called Arc, I think it was called Arclight. I think that was the name of the- Yeah, okay, I've heard of Arclight, yeah, yeah. And I, I also include like interior, exterior, uh, music cues, like in the, the script. So that's yeah. why I wasn't sure, like it would be, uh, like a minute a page. That's why I was I wanted to get your uh, constructive uh, it's opinion. It's about on. it's about a minute a page. So it'd be two hours. That'd be a two hour movie on the nose. I'd be so honored for you to read this, and I just would love to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, man. And Anytime. one one final thing before we wrap up, and I I waited a long time to do this for you because you deserve it, and that is thank you, Rob. Thank you, thank Rob. You, thank you, Rob. Rob. Thank, thank you, Rob. Rob. Thank you, thank Rob. You, Rob. And we can't wait to have you back on in the future. 
Oh, I'd be happy to come back anytime. Thank you for inviting me on your show. It's awesome. It's great to talk to you guys. I like uh, that you're both creative spirits. And uh, thank you for all your kind words. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for those appreciate memories. You. We, we appreciate you. This episode is actually the Rob Tinkler Appreciation Special. Alternate title. <laughs> well, I'm flattered. <laughs> you have a great night, sir. All right. Thank you so soon. much, guys. Have a good, good night. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye.